Welcome everyone out this morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to sing that song, We Bring the Sacrifice. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Continue singing, I'm under the rock. I'm under the rock, and the rock is higher than I. Jehovah hides me, he hides me under the rock. Go tell my enemies, I'm under the rock. Jehovah hides me, he hides me under the rock. 
slow it down we're gonna sing that song we fall down we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of jesus the greatness of
Revelation of glory be unto you, O Lord. La 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 in God's presence and there's a lot of places we go in our lives you ever walked into somewhere and you're just like ooh this place is funky right you go into a certain restaurant you go into a certain job site and overseas right certain things I've gone into and it's just like man this is there's something bad in this place you feel it you know when you come to church it's like you feel the presence of God and it is a blessing to be here this morning. We want to come before the Lord in prayer. I want to encourage you very much, amen, to not fear. Our brother Abel uh, did a crusade yesterday, and he preached a little sermon about don't fear, don't fear, don't be afraid. And he used Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Why? Because everything's perfect? No. Because he's with me. And I want to declare to you, my brother, my sister, in this place, the ch children of God, Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And so you can rest in his pre protection, his presence, and you need to know, amen, he's with you. Don't be afraid. Trust him whatever's going on in your life. Amen. There's hope for you in Christ Jesus. We want to come before the Lord and pray for a number of things. Our nation, we need God's help in our country, our military, our first responders. We want to remember the nation of Israel, God to minister there and protect them. We also want to pray for our daughter churches, our granddaughter churches, the church in Nicaragua, God to be with each one of them. We also want to pray for our focused fire request this week. Amen. God to move there uh, both domestically and internationally. So, Dodds, amen, over in uh, Chula Vista, Pastor Dodds praying, and I agree with him. Absolute, just the Holy Spirit to be poured out. Listen, if the Spirit of God comes and gets a hold of all of us, then it, it resolves all the other issues. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit in our hearts, our lives, our church, our nation, etc. And so that's a great prayer. So let's pray for the Chula Vista Church. Also, we want to pray for the Oropesas over in uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. God to continue to give them favor and souls to be saved, some specifics there we can pray about. Let's remember the Tempe Church, let's remember the Prescott Church, our leadership churches, our mother church as well, and God to move there. I want to pray salvation for a number of people that need to get saved. Uh, Michelle, Cody, Luis, Carmelita, Sandra, Tony, Rachel, Albert, uh, Louis, Johnny, uh, Destiny, Alana, Carlos, Alexis, Solozanzo families, the Ruiz Colon family, Stephen Ruiz and family, Gonzalez and Gaitan families. We want to pray for all of these. We want to need healing this morning for Samuel, for Sister Maggie, uh, Kimberly Vargas, for Freddie, also for Patricio. We also need God's grace in Jaime or in the Litchfield Church. And uh, just a victory report. Still praying for Hans. You know, he was here yesterday for outreach Amen. on the impact team in our building, in our city. First outreach at Hans is back for his Peoria. Hallelujah. That's a miracle. Amen. Amen. He got shot in the head two and a half months ago, ready to die the first night, and here he is back on outreach. Amen. Amen. The miracle God's done in Hans. So let's keep praying for him and his wife, Zulia. We also want to pray for our own building situation. God to minister there and uh, give us resources, but also... Amen. A favor with the building, some different uh, quotes and things I'm working on right now. So we also need salvation and healing for BJ, Kyle and Alyssa, Marie Carmen, uh, Lilia, Delia Gonzalez, Tommy Gonzalez as well. Uh, Jacob's drug addiction, God to bring deliverance there. And we also need uh, a couple people praying for finances, open doors and the favor of God in resources. How many have a personal need? You want to lift a hand and say, God, I have something on my heart. Jesus, I trust you. You're with me. And I'm going to trust you and not fear, but believe you. So let's pray. Put your needs before the Lord and pray about the church needs together. Brother John's going to open us with a good word of prayer. Let's pray before God. We come before you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. 
I take dominion, God, over every lying voice of hell, God, every work of the enemy against your people. And I pray, God, the spirit of the Lord to move and minister in grace, God, minister in power and save the lost, God, deliver and set free in the name of Jesus, God, to heal bodies. We bind death and sickness and illness and lose healing virtue in the name of Jesus. Um, minister in finances, God, pour out your glory. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning because we love you. We're here, Lord, to hear your word. We're here to see you continue to move in our church and our finances and our families. We bring all our prayers and cares in front of you. Bring all our church needs for other buildings, for other churches, Lord. All the prayers that were spoken in front of you, Lord. We ask that you speak to our pastor this morning, Lord. Let your word be heard. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please turn and get around a little bit. Say hello. Greet one another. God bless you this morning. to see every one of you this morning. We do appreciate all of you being here. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We're very, very glad to see all of you. And we welcome you warmly. Hallelujah. A few announcements. We do want to remind you tonight is our time of prayer at 530, the service at 630. I'll be preaching and spending some time a little bit tonight on budgeting, some uh, things that help us to be good stewards of our finances. So I wanna invite you back for tonight spe uh, specifically for that. Also, every married couple that's going to the marriage seminar, it's next Saturday night. So the deadline to sign up and to, to get that, uh, your name in there is tonight. And we can get the money from you by Wednesday, but we must have your name by tonight. We have to get a lot of preparation in place this week. So if you're going, please sign up on that list today and the deadline is tonight. And then also uh, Monday through Friday, we have prayer here at the building, various times of the morning. Uh, some different people come, at least a couple of us, and I wanna encourage you in that. I'm here from seven to eight, typically uh, the building's open for that. Tomorrow morning, as always, men, we're gonna be praying at 6 a.m. God's blessing on you and your finances in the week. <coughs> we'll invite you to come and meet me at six. And then tomorrow, we're gonna have a day of fasting and prayer. We're gonna put aside a day uh, to fast and pray for revival that's coming up uh, this next Sunday. Also for our building, for finances, and also I wanna uh, pray against hell and witchcraft, amen. The devil's not happy that the church is growing and that things are moving forward so the enemy comes in like a flood. But when he comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord lifts up a standard and the way you fight the devil is on your knees. And then you fight the devil contending, praying, believing God, fasting, and so I want to challenge you to that tomorrow. Join with me. Amen. We'll fast and pray and meet in the evening to pray from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, on Monday night. And Tuesday, our ladies prayer meeting is still continuing with Sister Mary DeVivo leading that. That'll be at 1130 a.m. And Wednesday night, 6 p.m. prayer, 7 p.m. service. And then Saturday is the marriage seminar with Ron Lahan coming in from Delaware with his wife, Bobby. We're going to have an outstanding time with him. He's been a pastor a number of years and uh, ministers very, very well. So really want to encourage you that. We're gonna have a full meal for everybody to eat, amen, games and prizes, a lot of good things at the marriage seminar. And we encourage you for that at six to 9 p.m. in the evening time on Saturday and I invite you out for that all married couples. Then Sunday through Wednesday, we have the revival with him. 
Uh, it'll start Sunday morning, go through Wednesday night. There's flyers available, English and Spanish, and we want to remind you about that. And let's be praying and contending for souls to come in in the revival. And that's all the announcements. We need to get a couple of reports this morning. I'm going to ask Brother John to give us a report from the Assisted Living Center Outreach and then Brother Abel from his Spanish crusade yesterday. So let's give John a hand. I can thank God for my salvation. Believe it or not, this is our third year going to the Assisted Living Home. We started at the end of 22, no, 21, no, 22. Then we were all 23, and now we're in 24. We had a good turnout yesterday. We had nine residents come, so a total of, uh, of uh, 12 people. And even though the person that's always there, Nejma, she's a Muslim, she stayed. It was the first time she stayed in a long time. Yeah, she was knitting the whole time, but I kept looking at her, and she was listening. She was paying attention. But she didn't pray, but she's hearing the word of God. We had two newcomers come for the first time, and both ladies prayed. Yeah, praise God. They had some good stories. Mary prayed with Pam. And um, Pam told her that when she came in, she was a Mormon. But she said she felt so empty reading the Book of Mormon. And then when she heard God's message, she got saved. Glory to God. Praise God for that. And I prayed with another lady, Fran. She didn't raise her hand, but I went up to her. I said, do you need prayer? She goes, I do. I said, for what? She said, my religious life. And I looked. I said, are you saved? She goes, I don't know. I want to find out. So I asked her a couple of questions. She found out. I did a simple sinner's prayer with her, and Jesus Christ saved her. <coughs> and I looked her in the eye, and I said, when you came here, you were seeking something. She goes, yeah. I go, you found it in Jesus Christ. Amen, yeah. She's very excited. And to us, to me and Mary, it's a big breakthrough. For those of you that, uh, that came and you know, been, been there, there's a woman, Mary. She's a nice lady. She has a really hard time speaking. You can't understand most of what she says, but she has a big smile on her face all the time. So before we started service, Mary, um, this Mary, went up to that Mary and um, took her to the text. So plain as day, she said to Mary, thank you. We both never heard her speak that way. And then she points to Mary. She goes, I like her. Then she pointed at me. She goes, I like him. And she pointed to the guy next to her. I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank God she's really starting to speak so it was amazing Amen. again I can encourage you guys if you've been there if you haven't been there come we're doing it again Saturday February 17th come Amen. thank you Bueno, voy a dar mi reporte en esta mañana. I'm going to give my report this morning. El año pasado, Dios estuvo tratando conmigo. Uh, last year, God was, uh, wor uh, was uh, encouraging me. Uh, dentro de mi corazón. In my heart. Eh, que yo estuviera comenzando a hacer cruzadas de sanidad y milagros. That, that I would begin to uh, start doing healing crusades. Y déjeme le digo, me preparé para hacerlo. And, and let me tell you, I did prepare to start doing this. Uh, hablé con mi pastor que Dios había tratado conmigo para que este año comenzara a hacerlo. Uh, I spoke with my pastor uh, to let him know that this year I was going to begin to do this. Lo, lo interesante es que Dios había tratado con mi pastor también para que lo hiciera. The, the funny thing is that, past, uh, that God was already uh, uh, tugging on pastor's heart that I, would, uh, that I would start doing this. Había una conexión ya de parte de Dios. There was already a connection there with God. Y bueno, este, también quiero dar las gracias a mi pastor porque yo hablé con él y pues claro, necesito el equipo para, para salir a hacer la cruzada de sanidad. And, and also I want to just thank Pastor, uh, I, I did speak with him and I let him know I needed the, the, the equipment to do this. También quiero dar las gracias a los hermanos que todos nos ayudaron para, para que esto se llevara a cabo. And I also want to thank our brothers that, that helped us uh, that, uh, so we could be able to do this. Uh, tuvimos una muy buena experiencia. We had a really good experience. Eh, uh, oré por dos personas en el lugar. I prayed for two uh, people in this place. Amen. Y déjeme le digo, déjeme le digo una cosa. Estoy seguro. And let me tell you one thing, I, I am sure. Que Dios va a sanar a la gente. That God is going to uh, heal people. Que Dios quiere que nosotros salgamos adelante. Uh, that God wants us to keep moving forward. Porque no es solamente un deseo de hacerlo. 
Because it's not just a, a want that I want to do this. Sino Dios me mandó a que lo hiciera. But God had sent me to do this. Y con todo mi corazón yo lo voy a hacer esto. And with all my heart I'm going to continue to do it. Y le aseguro que me voy a preparar para hacerlo bien. And I and I'm sure that I'm going to prepare well to do to do it well. Es todo lo que tengo. Gracias. a great time at uh, the park there in Youngtown, amen, some people were healed, and uh, it was Juana, I think, was healed, right? Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Did you say 15 years you had that pain, and no more since last night? <laughs> now we give God praise for that. Hallelujah, God. Thank you. Thank you that you healed, God. You are a faithful and a good God, amen. So appreciate my brother Abel, others that were there, and just encourage all of our men uh, amen. There's a green light, amen, for you to be able to do outreaches and happy to help you with that. Amen. Let's have our ushers come. We want to receive God's tithe and our offerings. Besides our Bible reading this morning, we were in Genesis 14. And uh, it's the story at the end where Abraham met the two kings. There's the king of Sodom and the king of Salem. So Sodom, of course, is a picture of the world and the way the world functions and their finances and, and their value system. Salem means peace, and it's the priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, that is the king of Salem. It's, it's a picture, actually, of Jesus. And so these two kings both came out to meet Abram, and Abram had to make a choice which one was going to be number one for him. The king of Sodom said, hey, you give me the souls and I'll give you all the stuff. The king of Sodom will bless us financially if we leave the souls aside. No time to win souls, only time to make money. That's the king of Sodom's offer. The king of Salem comes, he's the priest of the most high God and Abraham interacts with him by saying, I lift up my hand to the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And it says he gave him a tenth of all. He gave him tithe. It is a picture of putting the king of Salem first and making him the priority of his life and of his finances. In fact, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I'm not even gonna take even a shoelace from you. I'm gonna take everything from God, from the most high God, the king of Salem. So these are some powerful choices that he made and the demonstration of Abram's choice was done by tithing. He put the most high God first by tithing and giving him the 10th, the first 10th of all. This same, these same two kings still live today. The king of the world of Sodom is around us. And so is the king of God, uh, the king, God, the king of Salem, peace. And the question is, which one is going to be king in your life? Which one's going to be first? Jesus said it this way, you can't serve both. Right? Only one is going to be top dog, the other one's going to be despised. And we each have to choose. And the way we choose is, honestly, by tithing. And tithing says, I am placing my trust to supply my needs in God. Not in money, not in what I can do through a job, not in the efforts of the world and the natural world, I put my trust in the God who is supernatural. Because how many of you know, it doesn't make math sense to give God 10% and only be left with 90%. Amen? That doesn't make math sense. That's an act of faith. That's an act that puts God first. Like we've been learning in Sunday school, God gets the first tenth, the first fruits. Before we do all of our other bills, he gets the first portion. The first tenth is his. That's an act of faith. That's choosing to make him our Lord and him our source and him our blessing, not the world. 
So I simply want to encourage you and challenge you this morning to follow the father of our faith, Abraham, who chose to put the Most High God first by tithing, by trusting him, and by not marching to the beat of the king of Sodom's drum. It's not about money, it's about God. And I'm gonna put God first. And if you will do that, and I will do that, make those same wise choices as Abraham, then we will be like Abraham, we will be called the friend of God. We will be blessed by God so we can be a blessing. We will have destiny. We will have his promises when he is our king. Amen? When God's king, when he's number one, then those things begin to flow in our life. So I challenge you in that. Let's make the king of Salem, the most high God first. Let's tithe, let's give, let's honor him and put him in the place that he deserves to be this morning. Bowing our heads, Brother Javier, please pray. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be in uh, 26 through 28 this morning. One of the huge issues in our society today is the issue of racism. Many people interact with one another on that basis. There, of course, in America and around the world have been many years of efforts to resolve these issues and there are many people doing their best. They're doing their utmost to try to resolve these. Uh, but the truth is, it's really getting worse. It's not getting better, even with the efforts of many good-hearted people. And now in the last year or two, we've begun to see some extreme things. You know, systemic racism is a term that's being used now that somehow the whole structure of America is slanted against certain races and toward others. Also, they use a term, the patriarchal structure, which is a picture of a father-based uh, society that uh, defines order and structure in society, and we don't want that, and that's racist somehow. I've even read articles that say that math is racist. To say that two plus two equals four is a racist statement. That's the world we live in today, right? Where we're going with this. And the answer of some people to the issue of racism is to destroy everything and rebuild it back in a different way. So that's why they do all kinds of crazy things in cities and the things that they do. Here's the truth. Mankind does not have the answer for racism, but I have good news for you this morning. God has the answer. God is the creator of all people. God is the creator of all races and all ethnicities. God loves all people. Can you say amen? amen? That's why I have this sign when we go out street preaching. Because all lives do matter. Amen? Amen? Quote from Robert E. Lee, all ground is equal beneath the cross. 
And I want to preach another sermon, and my, I'm doing a little series, as you can probably tell, on the issue of Christian culture. And very much part of Christian culture is the answer to racism. And I want to just encourage you as a Christian and us as a church, the mind of Christ overcomes racist mindsets. And the answer to racism is the Christian culture and the Christian ethic. And so you can put that first slide up for me, please. And so let's read Galatians 3, 26 through 28 in the word of God. Amen. For you are all the children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And now there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is not slave nor free. There is not even male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We'll stop right there, amen. Christian culture is the answer to racism. So let's think first of all about the sin of racism. The interacting with one another as human beings based on the color of skin or a nationality of another person. So again, uh, can I get that next slide uh, for me? Lalo, hit that button for me. These are some signs that have been around in America and even other places. These are things over the years that exemplify different kinds of racism. There has been all kinds of this in America. There's been all kinds of this actually in the nations of the world. South Africa today is still in the throes of this. They got rid of apartheid, but now somehow it is good for black men to go and murder white farmers just because they're white. And this is true, and if you notice on my uh, signs that I have found here, racism goes every direction. Racism goes every way. <coughs> and in all different groups. In fact, past generations would view people of different races as inferior or unable to learn or unable to function in society. I remember being a kid in the, the 70s and then coming into the 80s and I was a football fan as a kid and so one of the big things in that time was they never thought that black men could be quarterbacks because their brain didn't work correctly to be function in today. That sounds so weird to say it, but back then it was a big deal if you had a black guy to be your quarterback. Of course, that's foolish, but that's the one mindset that many people had back in those days and in different, and even some today still. And actually, let's be real. This is an ancient issue. Racism didn't start in America. Racism started in the Bible and in world history. Right? The world history is filled with racial tensions and racial problems. The Egyptians enslaved the Jews. The Jews excluded other tribes and races. The Babylonians conquered the known world. They took over everybody. So did the Greeks. So did the Romans. So did the Mongols coming in from the northern part of China. More recent history is Japan that invaded China in World War II and just destroyed the country just because they were Chinese, not Japanese. It's true of the Germans in World War II that they destroyed people just for being of Jewish descent and of Jewish background. They were racists. And, and this is true all throughout world history. In the Bible, we read a account of a culture that was the Jewish culture. And in John 4, when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, she is shocked because it says there the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. In other words, there's a racial boundary that's there that the Jews practiced, and they would never interact with a Samaritan person. They would never even talk to them or interact with them at all. And of course, the Jews hated the Romans. They're conquerors. They hated them because they were Roman. And then the Bible in the New Testament was written, of course, in the book of Acts and on through in Roman culture. 
The Romans would conquer other nations. They would enslave people of other nationalities and make them their property. They could never attain Roman citizenship because they were not Roman citizens from birth. And so these were things that were functioning in the culture and in the society, amen, of the Bible times and of the time Jesus lived and in the time when the disciples lived. And this is still going strong today. Again, in my introduction, right, some of the things that we know are still happening. The reality of social media, that certain things become racist and, and uh, you can be, as they call it today, canceled because you have made some kind of statement that is deemed racist or something like that. You know, it's weird in our day, the wokeness idea, there's people that are black that are considered racist against blacks. And there's people that are white that are not considered racist because they accept the woke liberal, liberal theology. So it's a weird time that we're living in. And even today, amen, and nobody is honestly in our society and in our culture, amen, as far as an overall uh, uh, spirit of things, amen, people don't look at one another without seeing race. People look at one another and see race. That's the culture we live in. But I want to declare to you that racism is a sin. Go ahead, Richard, to the next one. Any kind of racism in any direction towards any other race or any other nationality. And let's be clear. One little point in our society. I'm just going to make one quick statement. Homosexuality is not a race issue. That's a choice issue. They want to equate homosexual rights to civil rights and race rights. It's not the same. You can't choose your race. You can choose your sexual orientation. Amen? Amen. So we have to be clear about that. But racism, and I'm talking about based on nationality and color of skin, is sin. The word sin means to miss the mark. That means that racism is practicing mindsets and actions that do not obey God, that do not line up with his word, and uh, are absolutely against God. And so that means ideas and mentalities of racist ideas is sinful. Here's the truth about God. He loves all races. The same. He created all races. You go back to Genesis 7, everybody was of one language, which pretty much means they were all one race as well. And God is the one that came down and confused their language, and then they spread out to different parts of the earth. That's why certain colors of skin and certain races are in certain geographic locations around the world, because God put them there. God created all those races. Jesus died for all races, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That means Jesus died for every race, every ethnicity, every color of skin on the planet. And God loves all of them. You know, the snapshots we get of heaven from Revelations, there's one in particular that shows us who the people are that are in heaven. All right, it's Revelation 7, and it's just one little snapshot. But think about this in terms of nationalities and how God sees them, verses 9 and 10. After this I beheld, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, of all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white, white robes and palms in their hands, and they all cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. In heaven, God welcomes all nationalities, all races, all people are there. So think about this. God does not view anyone through a racial lens. 
Ezekiel 18, 4, God says, All the souls on the planet are mine. God loves every person because they are an eternal soul. He doesn't see race. So that's why racism is sin. If you and I are holding different values than God, when we look at people, if we see them differently than God sees them, that's missing the mark. That's not lined up with God's truth. That's not lined up with how God sees it and the way God defines value for people. This especially applies to people that are born again. Christians, believers, which why we're here this morning, we all would say that about ourselves. You are called to live according to God's truth. Amen? Amen. Not according to a culture that's not God's culture. No matter what that culture might be. We are called to see people the way God sees people. We are called to view and interact with people the way God views and interacts with people. So racism may be in line with some form of a fallen culture, a fallen way that, uh, amen, we were taught growing up or from our background, whatever it might be. Uh, but remember something, brother and sister, uh, amen, any culture that's not based on the word of God is a sinful culture. Amen? Anything that doesn't line up with this book is a departure from truth. And by the way, if you go back far enough in human history, you'll find that every person that was alive on the planet all worshiped the God of the Bible at the same time. That means the original culture on the planet was everybody <coughs> worshiped the God of the Bible. Noah and his three sons and all their wives, eight people, were the only people alive on the whole planet and those eight got together in Genesis 8, and they worshiped the God of the Bible. They offered a sacrifice to God. So that means any culture that shifts away from God's truth, that's a sinful culture. That's a culture that doesn't line up with the Bible. Amen. That's not true Christianity. Racism is not. So there may be some here you might need to repent of racism. You might need to repent of looking at people through the eyes of race and interacting with them based on a racist mentality and to take on the heart of God. Because that's what the real Christian culture is, right? The Christian culture that we are called to live in is, uh, is the same heart as God, the same love and hates as God, the same values as God, the same way that we look at life and people like God does. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be Christ-like. And so it's a call to all of us to understand, and you got to identify it, racism is sin. Now let's talk secondly about the heart of God. You can go to the... Next one there. God loves all people of all races, tribes, and tongues, nationalities, ethnicities, and nations. In our text, again, let me read it to you after I've preached this first part, and let me just reiterate to you how the heart of God works here. Again, Genesis, or Galatians 3, 26. We are all the children of God through faith, in Christ Jesus. So that means when you and I believe in Jesus Christ, we repent from our sin and we make him the Lord of our life. The Bible says we are born again into a new culture, a new family. That means your identity now is not your race. Your identity is Christ. You are born again. And it says there that all that are baptized, right, are in Christ. We are made, it says, the children of God. Amen. And we are part now of the family of God. So that means, as you look there, verse 28, now there is no race. It says there's no Jew or Greek. In other words, those were the races that were there at that time. 
And Paul is writing and saying, in Christ, that doesn't matter anymore. There's no differentiation because of that. There's no Jew. There's no Greek. It says also there's no slave or there's no free. In other words, the social status that a person got saved in, some people were saved as slaves. Some people were saved as free men or free women, not slaves. But now they're all equal. It's not like one's better than the other in the kingdom of God and in Christ. Everybody's the same. And it even says there's no male or female. Now, that's not meaning God's a transgender. What that means is God doesn't see any of us in value based on whether you're a man or a woman. And in Greek and Roman society, it really mattered if you were a man or you were a woman because women were second-class citizens. Women were just above slaves in Roman society. And the Lord says, in my kingdom, in my culture, women are just as valuable as men. Amen. He elevated women to a place of value and of glorious dignity because God sees us all the same. And when you get saved and born again, each one of us is valued because Jesus' blood has been shed for each one of us. And Jesus' blood has been shed for all of us. And we are all saved and born again because of his blood and because of his sacrifice for us and our faith in it. That's the reason we're saved. And that means all those differentiations that the world has, the racist ideas, that doesn't belong in the church. That doesn't belong in the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus broke all racial barriers when he lived upon the earth. He shed his blood for people of all races. Romans 1, 16, our verse we've used recently, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And, and listen why. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. And he notices race to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Paul is saying Jesus Christ's gospel, the work of the Lord through Jesus Christ is available to all who will believe. The race doesn't matter. Jesus died for all of us. Romans 10, 12 and 13. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord does not value a Jew above a Greek. The Lord does not value any one race above another race. All who call on him will be saved. He is rich and gracious and merciful to all races, to all people. And he saves, it says, whosoever calls upon his name. In whatever language they use to call upon him, in whatever dialect they speak, in whatever background they may be from, if they will call on the name of Jesus Christ, he will save them. He broke all racial barriers. So remember, in Jewish times, only if you were a Jew could you be saved. <clears throat> this is completely opposite to the Jewish culture. The Jews not only believe that, what I just said, but they believe that if you weren't a Jew, you were basically fuel for the fires of hell. That's how a Jew viewed people of other races. They had the Bible they had Moses and the Torah. They had God, the one true God. Everybody else, too bad for you. You're not the right race. <coughs> That's how Jews saw people. And Jesus broke all of that. Jesus turned that culture absolutely on its head because he broke those racial barriers. He reached out to people, the Samaritan woman, the Syrophoenician woman, the man of Gadarenes, uh, the dynamics of Jesus Christ reaching out even on the earth. Uh, amen. He shed his blood uh, for people of all races. So the heart of God is for all races and for all people groups. This is still true. The gospel works in every culture. You know, we're praying for Cambodia. The gospel works in Cambodia. The gospel works in the Philippines. The gospel works in Mexico. The gospel works in Germany. The gospel works, amen, in China. The gospel works, amen, up on the res. The gospel works in South Dakota. The gospel works uh, in Canada. The gospel works uh, in England, in South Africa, wherever it goes. The gospel works because God, Jesus Christ, loves all people of all races. 
He saves whosoever will believe. And listen, I personally been around the, our fellowship a long time, since I was three. So that's coming up on uh, 49 years here. Pretty quick here, 48 years. So think about this. I have people that are my friends from all over the world. I have friends in Vanuatu, in Australia, in India, in China, in Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia, in the Philippines, in Mexico, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, in Costa Rica, in Venezuela, in Brazil, in England, in Germany, in Malta, in Moldova, in Ukraine, in Russia. I literally have friends from all over the world. There are people in our fellowship that have been saved by Jesus Christ of every race, of every background, of everyone. And you know what? That's the joy of being part of what we're a part of. The gospel is available to everybody. And that's a reality in our church. Whosoever believes shall be saved. This church at one year old, back in 1983, had six nationalities in it. This is the powerful thing about the heart of God. He loves all people. And this heart of God is deposited in his church. How is this heart of God shown to the world? Through the church. Through the church. Through you. Through me. The family of believers is called to have the same heart of God towards all people. Amen? Amen. Towards every race. Amen. You know, we have a great commission as a Christian. You have a great commission from your Lord Jesus that you are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You. Did you know all races, remember, are created by God? They are the creations of God. And we are called to reach all peoples. We are called to preach the gospel to all nations and all people groups and all races and all, all uh, people around us. It's very interesting to think along these lines about Acts chapter 2, the birth of the New Testament church. And I want you to think about something, about you know what God does first is very significant. Because how many of you know, God can do anything he wants. But what he does first, he's making a point about something. And if you read Acts chapter 2, you'll find out that uh, Jesus gave them in Acts 1, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he ascended into heaven. So then about 50 or 60, 50 days goes by and the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. The Holy Spirit has not fallen upon the church yet. And it says in Acts 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The day that Acts 1, uh, 2, 1 records is when the day of Pentecost had fully come. That's a picture of the feast of Pentecost in the Jewish religion. It had fully come. In other words, God did not pour out the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost had fully come. And it was on that day that they were praying in one accord in the church. They heard the sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. The tongues of fire sat on each of them. They began to speak with tongues and then they began to go public and outreach immediately, right? So God poured this out. This is the birth of the church that we're still a part of. Why did God wait 50 days? Because at the day of Pentecost, people would come to Jerusalem from all over the world. So the Lord waited to birth his church until as many nationalities as possible were in Jerusalem. We know that because when they spoke in tongues, the Bible lists all these different nationalities that heard them speak in tongues that got saved in that first outreach, uh, right? We, we read this in Acts 2, uh, 7. Uh, they were all amazed and marveled, all the people, the multitude that were there. Now, are not these which speak Galileans? And how do we hear in our own tongue the language we were born? And listen, here's the, the, the list. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, 
Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus, in Asia, in Phrygia, in Pamphylia, in Egypt, in Libya, in Cyrene, Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. Eighteen nationalities were saved in the first outreach of the Church of Jesus Christ. So think about this. Jesus Christ, this is his church. His stamp on the church at the beginning is multiracial. His stamp at the beginning is the gospel should reach every race, every nationality, every person. The followers of Jesus, we look at their lives and you realize they live this out in their life. Acts 8 is Philip, a Jew. They're all Jews, by the way, the disciples of Jesus. They're all strict Jews. That's how they're raised. But now in Christ, they're different. In Acts 8, Philip goes to Samaria and he preaches to the Samaritans. In Acts 10, Peter, Peter's led by the Spirit of God to go to the Romans, Cornelius' house, and minister to them. Paul, in Acts 16, has a vision of a man from Greece that says, come over here and help us. And he goes across the water to Greece and begins to minister there. These are Jewish men, Jewish people, uh, and yet they reached out to different nationalities. And, you know, it's also very interesting. Did you know that out of Jesus, 12 disciples, 11 of them were martyred? What that means is they were killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Only John died an old man. Everybody else was killed. And it's interesting where they were martyred. Little Jewish boys from little fishing towns in Israel, raised to hate every other race except Jews. But now in Christ, they went to these other nations. They went to these other places. And so think about this. Philip was martyred in Egypt. Thaddeus uh, was, and Andrew were martyred in Turkey. Thomas and Bartholomew were martyred in India. Matthew in Ethiopia, Simon the Zealot in Britain, Peter and Paul in Rome, and Mark was in Greece. Each one of Jesus' disciples lived their life reaching another race. So it's a good thing to ask today. Because this is the same call today. This is still the New Testament church. We're supposed to still have the Christian culture of the New Testament in our church today. Amen? Amen. And the good thing to ask is, are you, am I, reaching every race? Do we have a burden for people that are not like us? Do we have the heart of God that beats for every race? Every ethnicity, every people group. Are we reaching out to other races, not just your own? Are you making Jesus your Lord? Because in this place, I've said this recently, this place, this church, we're going to be a Christian church. Jesus is going to be Lord of this place. That means we're going to do things the way Jesus says to do it. Amen. And Christian culture, his will is that we reach all nations, all races. We are to preach the Savior here for all people. We are to embrace the Christian culture and to live it. And I want to just encourage you, church, and challenge you to be intentional with this. Can you learn some words of a different language? I encourage you, be intentional. Can you speak French? Well, there's a guy in Lupe's church that's from Haiti. They speak French. Don't you think it'd be good for Lupe to have a little French so he could communicate with that guy? Amen? Can you speak English? Can you speak Spanish? <coughs> what about Cebuano, Tagalog? Can you push yourself and kind of reach out beyond your language? 
and be a blessing if people come or reach them. Have you ever tried different foods? Different food. You know, in case you don't know, I'm white, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> Grew up in the Southwest. My mom tried for Mexican food, but my mom's not Mexican. But my wife is. And I want to tell you something. I, I know we're supposed to try food from a race. I've tried fry bread. I've tried, um, you know, the Asian foods, the Filipino foods, and all that stuff. And my personal thing, this isn't in my notes. It's not in the Bible. But I think we're going to have Mexican food in heaven. I'm just saying. <laughs> Except for John. He's going to have an Italian table all to himself. <laughs> but we have to be just real about this. Like, step out beyond. Right? My, my daughter, Adriana. At, here's why. Here's why it's important, church. Think about you, your, your nationality. If somebody is not your nationality and you can get them to try your food, it's like, oh man, I got you. There's something about that that's a win with that person, right? Same is true in the Philippines. You know, they have balut in the Philippines. Anyone know what balut is? Yeah. Balut's a duck egg that the duck grows to about halfway and then they kill it and they bury it in the ground and it rots and then a couple months later they dig it up and they eat it because it gives you they say it gives you protein much energy pastor I said whatever I'm having coffee <laughs> but my daughter Adriana ate two balut you know what they said to her you're a Filipina now there's something about food that connects you to people. So don't get so locked into your own food. Try different foods. Reach out to people that aren't like you. I'm not advising you to go have balut with, you know, Julius and Christy next time they come. But I'm just saying, can we be a church that's multiracial, that goes beyond just our race? Be intentional. What about going out of your way to meet people that are not like you? Listen, if you are waiting to witness to someone that's only just like you in your life, you're going to have a very small field of people to witness to. Because in case you haven't noticed, not everyone is like you. Did you know the highest demographic of ethnicity in Peoria? Do you know what that is? It's white. It's not Mexican. Are you waiting just for someone of your own race? Somebody that you, but, but Jesus didn't wait for us to be his race. Jesus didn't wait for us to, you know, be Jews so he could come reach us, did he? See, his heart was to reach beyond those boundaries and reach the soul. Now, let me give you a little key with talking to people of other races. There's something you can do with every person on the planet that is a common language. And do you know what it is? Okay, watch carefully. I'll give you a deep revelation. <laughs> Something about this that everybody gets. Some of you aren't smiling. Right? So you don't know somebody. Hey, how are you? It just happened to me yesterday. We're at the park in Youngtown. There's a black lady walking her dogs, and I went up to her, and I smiled. If you're a lady by yourself, walking dogs, and some strange guy comes up to you, you're not typically going to be like, hey, what's up? You're going to be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> right? I smile, give her an invitation to church, let her know Jesus loves her, and then she went on her way. That's all the con. But, but you have to push beyond yourself. That's the heart of God. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not only re reaching, listen, if I was waiting for someone who's half German, half English, and looks like a black guy to witness to, I'd be waiting a long time. We're called to reach every race, church. We're called to embrace the Christian culture and to go out beyond 
and to step out and reach those because our church is the deposit of the heart of God in this planet and in this city. We are the ones that are called to reach the people all around us. We are the ones that are to communicate the heart of God and the love of God for all people of all races. We are the ones. Colossians 3, 10 through 14, you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where in that there is neither Greek or Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humility of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do you. And above all these things, put on love. Love. God's love for all races. God's heart for all people groups. God's love for every ethnicity, not just your own. That you would take on the heart of God that loves all people because we are the ones that are called to live that Christian culture. I want to close with the blessing of God. Because here's what happens when we will do this. You will have supernatural favor with God and with all people. Abraham, again, our father in the faith. I was very interested in this I read it a little bit this morning. Um, amen. His call to follow God involved particular choices about race. And it does for us as well. Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said to Abram, come out from your country. Come out from your country. Come out from your kindred. And from your father's house to a land I will show you. Abram was not a Jew. He was a Chaldean. And he was called to leave that behind in order to put God first. He called him out of his race and out of his nation. God did. God called him out of his overall family, your kindred. In other words, your last name doesn't matter anymore. And out of his father's house, his own personal home, to put God above all. So if you and I are going to be people that walk in faith like our father of the faith, Abram, then we have to make the same choices he did. To put aside race, to put aside family domination, to put aside personal home issues, to make God the, the king of all of our lives. That we answer his call. We're living for him. And God, as he did this, God's promise was fulfilled to him. And this is what's for all of us. Genesis 12 again, the follow-up verses 2 and 3. If you do this, basically the Lord's saying, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless them that bless you and curse those that curse you. And in you, all the families or all the races of the earth will be blessed. So the father of our faith, the one we say we want to be like, we should all be striving to be like Abraham. He had to make decisions to put God above his race, above his family, above his personal home, his father's house. And as he did that, <coughs> covenant, blessing, and he became a blessing to all the families in the earth. All the races of the earth are blessed through a person that will step out like our father in the faith and make the same choices. The other thing this does is it gives favor to the church. I want to remind you that when you come to church, the unity among the brethren is a huge deal. It's not okay to be sniping at each other and racial issues between each other or other strife issues between each other. Because here's why. Psalm 133, 1 through 3. Behold how good... And how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It says, for, for it's like the ointment, the anointing oil that comes down Aaron's head, down on his beard to the foot of the garment. And verse 3 says, it's there, the place of unity that God commands blessing. That means if, if we function in a racist way, we drive off God's blessing. 
If we function in a divisive way, yeah, me against you and you against me and us against them, then it drives away God's blessing. God commands blessing on a people that are in unity, a people that surrender to Christian culture, a people that take that on for themselves and live it together. That's where God commands his greatest blessings. And so this is the powerful truth that we need in this church. We need to be a people that live in the Christian culture. We need to be people that make uh, corporate decisions to embrace the heart of God, to preach the gospel of Jesus to all races and all ethnicities. And when people come in our midst, we all welcome all of them. All of us. Welcome all of them. It doesn't matter their race. It doesn't matter the background. It doesn't matter all of that. Even if it's someone that's a backslider and a prodigal you had problems with before, can't Jesus save people? Yes. Can't Jesus turn it around? Yes, can. Do we really believe that? Then when they come, don't treat them like before. Be gracious. Amen. Be welcoming. That's what it means to be a Christian church. Yes. So, the blessing of God comes when we will function like this. Now, last slide. All of this reminded me of somebody very particular. Next click. <clears throat> Eva was a real Christian. In case you didn't notice, she's not the race of any of us. If you don't know, this is Eva Smith. She's part of our church for many years. Passed away a couple years ago, made it to heaven. Pictures are of her with all different races of people. Did you know I'm sure Eva suffered racism in her life? But as a Christian, she was not a racist. She loved every one of us. She prayed for all of us. You know who would greet every visitor that came to church? And at the end, she has her stroke, she would shuffle over to them with a smile. Thank you for coming to our church. My name's Eva. She lived real Christianity. You know, Eva always said she had three sons, a black son, a Mexican son, and a white son. We all know who her black son is, that's Junior. David's the Mexican son. And in case you didn't know, I was the white one. At least that's what she told me, but she might have told that to every pastor that was here, I don't know. <laughs> Eva lived real Christianity. She didn't see anybody through racial eyes. Will you be like Eva? Will you be a real Christian? Get past race? Because the answer to racism is Christianity. We have the answer. And when people come in here, they should know they're valued and welcome because they're an eternal soul. It doesn't matter their color of skin. It doesn't matter their ethnicity. It doesn't even matter their language. All that matters is Jesus died for them. And we want to help them make it to heaven. That's all that matters. And everybody here can be that kind of a Christian. It should inspire us. <clears throat> It should inspire you. She lived it, man. Oh, we do. And I challenge you to embrace the Christian culture about race. Not whatever background you all may have, but the way the Bible says to function. In it, that we will be those kinds of Christians. Amen. Let's all bow our heads together this morning. Let's have the heart of God for all races. <coughs> the heart of God for all people.
here's the truth, hey, man. If you if you got your heart right in this, you don't even see people uh, based on their race. I can honestly say, in all my years of growing up and stuff, I've I've never been. I've never thought like that. I had people one time in another church uh, report that uh, somehow I didn't like Mexicans. I'm like, I married a Mexican. My kids are half Mexican. My in-laws are Mexicans. My wife's Nana at the end of her life called me mijo. That's a ridiculous statement to make. My kids both married natives. My daughter-in-law is half Navajo, half Czechoslovakian. Don't ask me how her parents hooked up, but whatever. And my son-in-law is half Mexican and half Akama, or about a quarter Akama Indian. Kimberly's a half Akama from New Mexico. So my kids are going to be all native grandkids. I love it. You know why? Because Jesus saves all of us. Jesus loves all of us the same. He doesn't see us like that. And we should not see others like that either. So I challenge you, church. Eva was a shining example of this in our church for many years. That you would be that kind of a Christian. You would take on that kind of Christian culture. That's real Christianity right there. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you don't know Christ as your Savior, I declare to you there is hope for you. There is transformation available for you. It's through a miracle of faith in Jesus Christ. He can forgive of all sin. He can wash you clean. He can transform your life. He'll cause you to be born again. If you'll give your heart to Jesus today and turn to him, he'll save you, forgive you, set you free. If you're a backslider, he'll do the same. He can restore you. There's hope for you, backslider. Doesn't matter if you're watching online or here in the room. Doesn't matter what's happened and what the water under the bridge is. If you'll get it right with Jesus Christ, you can be restored. There's hope for you in Christ. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You want to pray and get right with God. Unsaver, backslider, you lift up your hands. Say, man, that's me. I'm off track or I've never... I see us. Thank you so much. Amen. Anyone else? Just be, I'm off track, Lord. And, and God, I, I want to get it right. I'm, I'm not on the right vein of things. I've, sometimes we make decisions and there it goes and we're in this path and we didn't mean that, but that's where we are. But Jesus allows you turns. Jesus allows us to turn around. He's the God of second, third, fourth. Many, many, many chances. He's long suffering. He's patient. He's gracious. He's good. Anybody else? You're not saved or you're a backslider. You want to get your heart right. Would you lift up your hand? Just say, Lord, here I am. I'm, I'm in the wrong way, but I want to get wrecked. Anybody at all? Okay, with our heads bowed then for a minute, amen. Sister, would you look at me, please? Come on, team. God's going to help you. I need one of our ladies to pray with our sister. Thank you for coming, okay? God's going to minister to you, all right? Yeah, come on. Whatever. Come on up. Amen. Let's stand together, church. I really want to encourage you in this. I... Really on Friday morning in prayer, I got very stirred about this. And that's where this sermon came from, just the dynamics of, of, of Christian culture and how important this is. This is a big deal right here. Our society really does run on those racial lines, and we can't allow that in the church. We have to be Christians. So I urge you, be at the altar, lay hold of God, about your part in this, take on the heart of God. Don't be a racist. Don't live like that. Don't, don't look like that. Look through the eyes of Christ. All lives matter. All of them matter to the Lord. And let's be that kind of a Christian church. Can you say amen? Amen. I want to open the altar for you. You come and pray as God has spoken to you. Amen. Lalo, go ahead and pray and uh, sing. Anoint me with fresh oil. Oh, God, help us to have your heart.
One of the things that gets said around a lot now is that, you know, Jesus wasn't white, and I agree with that, right? The, some of the pictures we have of Jesus and the actors in the movies are always white guys, and I don't know if that's really the case. In fact, I would say it's not. And what you need to know about Jesus, though, that's interesting, is that, so one, he was a Jew, right? He wasn't even your race or mine. He's a Jew. Correct? Mary's a Jew. But what's interesting in the Bible, lineage is important and who's in your family line. And in the line of Jesus are two women that were not Jews. Rahab, who was a Canaanite and actually a prostitute. And Ruth, who was a Moabitess. They're both in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So what should that tell us about the Lord, about God? God saves everybody. That's what it should tell us. His own son is of a mixed race. Amen? Amen. So you need to think about that. Jesus was not white. Jesus was not Mexican. Jesus is not native. Jesus is not Filipino. Whatever your race might be. No Jews that I know of in our church. Anybody that's Jewish? Oh, John is. 
they're Italian. <laughs> they're definitely not Jews. Might be half. There you go. So, so of everybody here, John will be half qualified to be where Jesus would be of the same race, right? That's it, though. So no one else is. So our Savior, our Savior, went beyond every racial issue. Because it's not about the race, it's about the heart, it's about the soul. And I want to so encourage you, take on that same heart yourself. <clears throat> take on that same heart. Reach out to people that are not like you. So, background story. When we first got married, my wife and I. So... Her mom tells her, because Monica was coming to our house with my parents to have a dinner, and Monica tells her, uh, Monica, they're white. They use all their forks just right. You better use the right fork and be all proper and all this stuff. So Monica comes and she's like, what the heck do I do? I just eat with a tortilla normally. <laughs> but you know what happened? She looked around, kind of did it, and then realized it's not a big deal. First time I went to her grandparents' house in Mesa. It's a house that's about, at that time, about 800 square feet, and there's like 50 people there. You know how Mexicans party. <laughs> and out in the backyard is all the guys. They're drinking beer and throwing horseshoes. And I walk out there, I'm the only white guy for miles. <laughs> like, hi, <laughs> you want a beer? No, I don't drink. But you know what, they, I never felt unwelcome at that house. My wife's Nana, who was just a simple lady, she would wear a bandana all day because she sweat all the time. She's always cooking tortillas. She's always doing those things that are just wonderful. And, and so she's about to meet my grandmother, who was a teacher. Because we're getting married, right? I gotta meet the family. So her nana told, I think your, uh, your, your, uh, my mother-in-law or somebody later, my, my uh, Margaret was very nervous to meet my grandma, Lois, and very nervous because Margaret's not very well educated. My grandmother's a teacher. But they got together. They immediately realized it's not that way, and they became friends. In fact, I'll tell you one point I'm very proud of of my grandmother when she was a teacher. There was an old article clipping in our, uh, their stuff when she passed away that she was a teacher, but there was a time in the 1960s, even in Phoenix, there was segregation. The blacks would only live in a certain area, a certain neighborhood, and she's not black, she's white. But you know what? There's a picture of her in the paper with another lady, another white lady. They went into the black neighborhood to teach those kids. In the 60s, that was an intense choice to make in the 60s. She got past all that racial nonsense to care for the kids. And I was very proud of my grandmother when I saw that picture of her. And I'm just saying to you, behind the scenes, brother and sister, really it's because of the gospel. The Lord has been able to help us in our family. <clears throat> So I just want to encourage you. We're Christians. Let's be Christians. Right? We're not white, Mexican, whatever it is. Whatever the race is. That's not who we are. We're Christians. We're Christians first. Amen? And I want to encourage you to view others in that same way. Reach out to people that are not like you. Because here's the point of those stories. Sometimes you view people in a certain way, and that's not it at all. They don't even think like that. Reach out past that. Reach out to people. And think about it. If God sent Jesus, not like you, to reach you, not your same race, then couldn't he send you to reach someone of a different race? Things to think about, church. I encourage you and I challenge you in it. Let's be the people that are true Christians. Can you say amen?
Appreciate you, brother and sister. We got prayer tonight, service tonight. Don't forget, brothers and sisters, married couples, today is the last day to sign up for the marriage seminar. If you're going, please sign up so we know who we can plan for, and that'll be a blessing. Let's bow our heads and be dismissed today. Lord, I thank you for your word today, your grace in our lives and in our church. I thank you for every person, God, the salvation you've brought to all of our lives, and you've linked us together in your family. And I thank you, Father God, for this. And I pray that we would take on the heart of God. We leave this place functioning in that heart and love for one another and for those not like us. I pray your blessing on the people of God. Bring us back safely tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.